Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Behind Headlines. And in this programme tonight, we shall be marking the second anniversary of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine that occurred on the 24th of April 2022. Two years on, this conflict's in stalemate, despite the fact that the West is pumping billions into Ukraine uh, in terms of military support. We see also that uh, uh, Putin is clamping down on any opposition um, inside Russia and has also threatened the West with a nuclear Armageddon if, uh, if Russia loses in this war. And we see also that the war in the Ukraine has not only caused uh, geostrategic problems, but it has also brought about a, a huge amount of political and uh, regional instability. It's led to a huge increase uh, in energy prices, but also has meant a kind of increase in the cost of food around the world with starvation as well. So with so much uh, happening in the Ukraine and in Russia, uh, this is where we're turning our attention to on Behind Headlines. Uh, Reagan, it's great to be doing a programme with you, but it's also good to be returning to this issue of, uh, of the war in Ukraine two years on. Uh, we know that pretty much it's come out of the media spotlight because of Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza, and this is what our international media is fixated upon. But we also see, for example, that Russia is going nowhere, uh, that Putin still poses a threat not only to the Russian people themselves, but also to the Ukrainians and Eastern Europe. So this makes this a huge geostrategic story that has prophetic uh, implications. Yeah, it's hard to believe that two years ago we were speaking about uh, what at the time looked to be an impending invasion and then was an actual invasion against Ukrainian sovereignty and freedom and its ability to control its own borders with a rapid onslaught headed directly to Kiev. The aftermath now two years on is truly catastrophic and there have been various moments where it seemed that there was a turning point or a shift. There have been times where it seems like Ukraine might have the upper hand, other moments where Russia clearly seemed to have the upper hand. But essentially, I think it's very difficult for us to arrive at any other conclusion at this stage than that this is an ongoing stalemate and there doesn't seem to be any particular end in sight to this conflict. No, absolutely. And of course, we have to remember that um, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine was the biggest invasion that Europe has seen uh, since 85 years ago with the start of the Second World War. It caused the largest refugee crisis Europe has seen since the Second World War. So the magnitude of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is incredible. Um, and then there's a direct response to that. We've seen, for example, uh, in Scandinavia, uh, Sweden kind of mobilised for war. The Baltic states are digging in trenches for a possible invasion. And also Germany now is preparing its people uh, for a potential war with Russia. So, you know, effect effectively what we could see that if, if Russia then decides to invade the Baltic states or another, or Poland or another Eastern European country, then, uh, and if they're members of NATO, then this automatically triggers World War Three. So the circumstances and the situations that we find ourselves in this recording are extremely precarious when it comes to Russia. As well as the reality that any meaningful opposition to Putin has been crushed, in particular just in very recent days, uh, only four or five days uh, ago at the time of this recording, we're uh, seeing the primary opponent, Alexei Navalny, was assassinated. It's believed that he is yet another victim of uh, Putin's onslaught against any and every opponent. Uh, again, using very likely Novichok or some other um, nervous system shutdown chemical. And, uh, th you know, this is just par for the course from the past few years. Not only opponents who uh, are, are political opponents in an explicit way, like Navalny, but even generals, uh, other people of status who've questioned or said perhaps things should be reconsidered or reevaluated. Business people, billionaires, uh, other oligarchs. As well. 
Exactly, and, and, and the knock-on effect uh, of this has been that you have so many people living in a, a state of terror and fear, uh, concerned lest they become Putin's next target, uh, as well as the knock-on effect on countless Ukrainian lives, I even those who have not been affected by loss of life in, the, in their family. We have so many, as you indicated, the refugee crisis, uh, that's had a knock-on effect even here, because uh, even this past week, I've seen reports of people who have signed up. They signed up for the Ukraine um, Family Shelter uh, Initiative, which sees the government pay a set amount for them to house. But really what the government gives subsidizes. It does not cover all costs. And there are so many who are now at a, a almost breaking point as well feeling like they cannot continue to house these refugees, but the refugees don't, in every case, have anywhere to go. Um, so it, it's a very difficult dilemma and that we're seeing the uh, economic downturn, energy prices, catastrophic impact on And the food prices as well, huge increase, Indeed. because we also got to remember really that, uh, that Ukraine is the bread basket of the world. Uh, and feeds yeah. not only Europe, but also North Africa and the Middle East is why we're seeing a huge increase in the oil price prices of wheat, as well. Bread, yep. I'm talking about co like cooking oil prices, yes. um, yep. olive oil prices, Sunflower all of these oil. cooking, uh, rapeseed oil, all, uh, so many of these oils. Uh, as you said, there's the breadbasket element. There's also the side of that where um, the oil is produced, let alone the discussion of crude oil, um, wherein we have seen so many sanctions against Russia. Russia has its alliances. Uh, India, the world's most populous nation, continues to be serviced by uh, Russian oil companies. So in one way, our Western sanctions against Russia, they've had some impact, but they've not had the impact that was thought they would have. No, absolutely. So let's remind ourselves of the uh, tragic events that shocked the world that occurred on Friday the 24th of February back in 2022. Uh, so we see that according to the Center for Strate uh, Strategic and International Studies, the initial Russian invasion force uh, numbered in the region of 190,000 troops. That included militias in the Donbass region, security forces, ground combat troops are believed to be in the region of 140,000. Uh, and then according to Newsweek publication, here we go, how many people have died in Russia, Ukraine war? Uh, it's estimated those killed in the conflict has been hard to, to come up with, uh, with neither side publishing tallies of their losses. A US official said in August that Ukraine and Russia total deaths and injuries has neared nearly half a million people. The general staff of the Ukraine uh, Armed Forces has published a total of Russian losses since the invasion on February the 24th, 2022. Its most recent estimate was published on the 31st of January, said that in the region of 379,610 Russian personnel have been lost. Uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times uh, reported in December 2023 that a declassified US intelligence assessment shared with Congress estimated that 315 thousand Russian personnel have been killed or injured since the start of the invasion, amounting to 87% of its pre-war force. And the Russian invasion in Ukraine has created the biggest refugee crisis Europe has seen since the Second World War. It's important to consider Britain's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. According to the British Foreign Office and Neil Holland, the British ambassador to Ukraine, dated December 13th of 2023. Um, during this year, Ukraine's critical national infrastructure has been attacked remorselessly by Russia, resulting in unacceptable civilian deaths and injuries. The UN Human Rights Office, the OHCHR, uh, figures show over 27,000 civilians uh, have been killed since the invasion. 9,000, rather casualties, 9,701 killed, 17,748 injured, with additionally reports detailing countless horrific human rights abuses, uh, violations including conflict-related sexual violence against women and girls, not to mention against civilian detainees and prisoners of war, including a rise in cases against males. 
it's not just a violation of human rights on a, a massive scale. Russia's aggression has had a wide impact across all three dimensions, as we will no doubt hear shortly uh, from the three chairs um, in um, at this particular conference that was held. So let's have a look now at uh, and remind ourselves of the day that shook the world. And this is when Russia invaded the Ukraine back on the 24th of February, 2022. War sirens wailing in Kyiv before dawn, followed by early morning explosions in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. Explosions reported near Kyiv and other cities across Ukraine as Russia targeted key infrastructure, military air bases, and air defense systems. The bombing sent Ukrainians scrambling for safety. These scenes are from the port city of Mariupol. People lining up at ATMs and packing up their cars. In Kyiv, the capital, traffic backing up as far as the eye can see. Overnight, President Putin announced the beginning of Russian military operations in Ukraine, disguising his full-scale invasion as a mission to support Russian rebels in the Donbass region of Luhansk and Donetsk, land he claims belongs to Russia. Now a doorway for Russian troops into Ukrainian territory. It won't be bloodless. Uh, there will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. Ukraine's foreign ministry says they've landed in the southern port of Odessa, crossing into Kharkiv. This security footage shows Russian military crossing into Ukraine from Crimea, the peninsula seized by Russia in 2014. Ukrainian forces are fighting back in Donbass, as well as regions in the north and south. Dozens of soldiers reported dead so far, as well as civilian casualties. President Zelensky calling on Ukrainians to rise up and fight the invaders in the cities and town squares, encouraging citizens to take up arms. The country's UN ambassador delivering this message to Russia at last night's Security Council meeting. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. Ambassador. Meanwhile, the world community is responding with promise of sanctions, but no military aid. We are banding together in strong terms to condemn these outrageous acts in the strongest possible terms. President Biden issuing a statement last night saying, quote, Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction this attack will bring, and the United States and its allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way. The world will hold Russia accountable. The president is expected to address the nation at noon today and announce crippling economic sanctions against Russia. The White House has been very clear it will not send troops into Ukraine, even to rescue Americans. However, U.S. troops are on the border with Poland and ready to help those fleeing from Ukraine. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, viewers will remember the days that followed that uh, report. Uh, we began to see more and more condemnation as depicted there by world leaders. At the same time, while there was not a, a initially anything more than sanctions, there has been an immense amount of military aid provided without actually putting boots on the ground. Absolutely. And um, Zelensky needs a huge amount of credit because when the Russians invaded the Ukraine, it was Biden that said to Zelensky, we can give you free access to you and your family to go and live in the States if you want to flee the Ukraine. The US he was stayed. willing to let it go. He stood, he stood and he mobilized the entire country of yep. Ukraine behind him and said, I'm staying, I'm your commander in chief. I will actually fight with you. And no one thought that he was capable of doing this. Mm. And I also think, for example, um, Putin really under, underestimated the incredible resolve of the Ukrainian people, their ability to fight, their ability to respond to this attack. And it's almost like since over the past two years, almost a third of Russia's armed forces have been wiped out. The colossal impact in loss of life, Russian life, of uh, those soldiers who are fighting that don't really want to be there. Um, and then of course, what he's done is he's completely shut down any opposition to himself or to the war, um, or opposition to the war within Russia itself. Uh, you know, he's aligned himself closer to his, uh, 
access of evil, such as the Chinese, the Iranian regime as well. And uh, we're seeing this new anti-Western bloc um, emerged since he's invaded the Ukraine as well. And of course, with invading Ukraine, means that this is a direct threat to European security. And this is why the EU has responded in the way that it has. But I think we've also got to take into account the sheer horrendous atrocities and human rights abuses committed by Putin's forces, as well as the attack by the Wagner force uh, on innocent Ukrainian civilians that have been caught up in this horrific war that's now approaching its uh, third year. Yeah, I mean, who can forget the horrifying massacre at Bucha uh, that was primarily perpetrated by the Wagner group? Uh, we see that throughout this time of, of conflict, Russia has relied very heavily, very heavily on uh, even the use of ex-cons and bribing current convicts as well to serve militarily for the sake of an earlier release. They've changed their policy a couple of times, but the Wagner Group, as it was uh, prior to some of the events that occurred last year, was extremely catalytical, not just in perpetrating some of the most heinous of acts and uh, accomplishing Putin's dirty work, but Mariupol as well, the siege that went on there for some time. Uh, very, very critical um, actions undertaken uh, on Russia's behalf there and uh, heinous war crimes reported. And of course also what we see uh, in the aftermath of uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine back on the 24th of February 2022 uh, was uh, <coughs> incredible leadership shown by then Prime Minister Boris Johnson who showed solidarity with Ukraine and was the person who mobilised the kind of Western response to Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. So following on from that, this is the, uh, the outline of British foreign policy to the Ukraine, um, as announced by the uh, British Foreign Office. It says the UK has been and is a proud to support Ukraine through the OSCE bilaterally and through other multilateral channels. Uh, this year, the Ukraine Recovery Conference raised more than 60 uh, million, uh, sorry, 60 billion US dollars for reconstruction and post-conflict recovery. We look forward to Germany's 2024 conference. The UK has contributed 4.1 billion pounds to fiscally support for the Ukraine and over 640 million in bilateral assistance. The UK's total military, humanitarian, economic support for Ukraine now amounts to 9.3 million pounds. Oh, sorry, billion pounds. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, we know that uh, we're in good company with friends and allies around this table also giving significant uh, support. Uh, we have also moved quickly to ensure that those who have fled persecution in Ukraine can find safety. The UK, through the Ukraine Family Scheme, and Homes for Ukraine has something in the region of 247,000 uh, visas now issued in total for the UK. And the year that followed saw immense devastation and a great deal of speculation as to what was next. Would Russia eventually prevail? Would Ukraine? Uh, we have this review of that first year and report from our friends at CBN. February 24th, 2022, life as Ukrainians knew it comes to an end. A full-scale invasion by land, sea, and air as Russian troops pour into Ukraine. World leaders immediately levy sanctions on Russia. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine without provocation, without justification, without necessity. This is a premeditated attack. More than 70,000 Russian troops try to encircle the capital, Kyiv, but the advance bogs down quickly. Russian troops are poorly trained, led, equipped, and very poorly motivated. They encounter fierce resistance. Here, you can see that they are taking the sand out of the children's playground and using them to make sandbags with. If we don't stop them now, my grandchildren must fight in maybe 20 years later. We must stop this 
As the invasion bogs down in late spring, Russia resorts to long-range missile strikes, causing thousands of civilian casualties and billions in property damage. Hospitals, homes, and schools are often the targets. This lady behind me, his name is Olga, and her home was destroyed by a very large missile. Blew up all the houses in this area. It's just a residential district. There's no uh, military targets here or anything. She's a Russian speaker. She's lived in this house all her life, and she has no plans, no money to be able to go anywhere else. So she's just sort of sifting through the rubble at this point, trying to decide what to do next. By April, it's clear the Ukrainians will hold Kyiv and Russia pulls back to refocus their combat power in the east. After the withdrawal, liberated areas reveal horrific Russian war crimes and human rights abuses. Russia captures Mariupol in May after four months of costly fighting. Thousands die in the process and the city is reduced to ruin. As Russian cruise missiles, cluster munitions, and thermal barrack weapons fall, Ukrainian farmers cannot ship their grain to market, causing another humanitarian crisis. Wheat supplies plummet, causing a global shortage. Concerns about fighting at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant dominate the summer airwaves as Russia holds the facility hostage and endangers its employees. What's at stake is the nuclear safety and security of the biggest nuclear power plant in the European continent. Ukraine launches a counteroffensive in September. They quickly liberate over 600,000 square kilometers in the north, and soldiers say donated American equipment makes the difference. One of our soldiers uh, with the technology, it's a stronger than maybe 10 or 20 soldiers from Russia. This help us to, to win. Ukrainians also get creative with off-the-shelf technology, using standard camera drones to take out hundreds of Russian tanks. Suffering heavy losses, Putin orders the first military mobilization since World War II. More than a million Russian men flee to avoid conscription. September, Russia annexes four Ukrainian oblasts. The Crimean bridge is bombed days later. Soon afterward, the Ukrainian army retakes Kherson, handing the Russians their worst defeat yet and sparking street celebrations. These Christians moved in to pray for their city. Uh, I can't even express what I'm feeling. It's, it's a happiness, and uh, for me, it's, it's a mountain that was impossible to be moved, but it was moved only by God. Russia targets critical infrastructure as winter approaches, using the cold as a weapon. Daily rocket attacks leave many Ukrainian villages without electricity, water, or heat. Battle lines harden as President Zelensky requests more aid because his army is firing more artillery in a month than most countries acquire in a year. Operation Blessing and Orphan's Promise have been assisting Ukrainian Christians since the beginning, providing desperately needed help to the frontline areas and displaced families across the country. And I see that these people who are still be here, this church, who are serve people here, they fighting for me too. It's like another level of soldiers. One year after the invasion, Russia has yet to realize any of its strategic goals, and escalation seems increasingly likely as NATO deploys more troops to their eastern border. A new Russian offensive with up to 500,000 troops hopes to defeat the Ukrainians before they can field promised tanks and long-range weaponry. But Ukraine now has a million-man army and is better prepared and equipped. Experts say the war could last years, but whether Ukraine gets the weapons it needs in the next few months could make all the difference. From Ukraine, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Well, that was a great overview by our friends from um, CBN uh, looking at the war in Ukraine throughout the whole of 2022. And of course, we're now in 2024, a year on from that news report, and it's still stalemate. But the uh, situation is going dangerous uh, by the day as we see uh, Russia threatening uh, nuclear weapons. Um, Let's talk about the current status. Of this, you mentioned the uh, term stalemate there, and I think that's the term that's being used increasingly. Uh, and, and yet, there definitely has been a resurgence of counteroffensive against Russia that has to be considered. Financial Times reports that Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said long term defense agreements being struck with Germany and France have heralded a new security architecture for Ukraine as well as new opportunities. 
Zelensky signed a bilateral defense accord with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Berlin on Friday. Under the agreement, Germany will provide military aid worth $7.1 billion in 2024 and will lead an effort by allies to equip Ukraine with modern air defenses while contributing to other coalitions providing it with armor, artillery, IT, as well as drones. Berlin has announced an additional military aid package worth $1.13 billion over the next four years. The Ukrainian leader is expected in Paris on Friday evening to meet President Emmanuel Macron and sign a similar long-term security agreement with France. The defense agreements come after Ukraine's military says it has destroyed a large Russian landing ship on Wednesday and yet another blow to Russia's navy in the Black Sea. The destruction of the Caesar Kunikov is the latest in a series of Ukrainian drone and missile strikes against Russian ships and naval facilities that have helped break Moscow's blockade of the Black Sea. The Russian Navy has been forced periodically to move its ships away from Crimean waters simply to protect them from attack. And also we see with uh, slow progress uh, to its uh, counteroffensive, uh, Russia is showing no signs of quitting. Uh, Ukraine faces a protracted war that requires long time support from its allies who are also focused on Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza. According to The Economist, um, Adivka uh, falls at last as uh, Russian, uh, Russia presses along the front line uh, with, uh, and scores its first uh, battlefield success for almost nine months. In the early hours of February the 17th, uh, Colonel General uh, Skyskos, uh, who was appointed as Ukraine's Commander-in-Chief only on Friday the 8th of, uh, of February, announced that in order to avoid their being encircled, he was pulling his troops out of the eastern town of Adafka and moving them towards more favourable lines. Well, uh, we should definitely spare a thought for the people of Abdivka there as they now have been taken over. With a population of 32,000 in that town as well. So. Exactly. It's very significant. The fall of Abdivka with its giant coke plant had been expected for weeks. Although the town is small with a population of just 32,000 uh, before the war and almost none now, uh, the withdrawal now makes military sense as it remains a blow for Ukraine's armed forces and for its President Vladimir Zelensky. The loss of Avdivka, well defended and strategically located, marks Ukraine's worst defeat since the fall of Bakhmut last May. And of course this is coming at a time where uh, the whole budget for the Ukraine is being speculated over uh, in the United States Congress and um, support for the Ukraine has become bipartisan now uh, with many of the Republicans questioning the amount of military aid and finances that are being spent by the Biden administration to the Ukraine as causing a bit of a rift and uh, we see also that the Republicans are starting to take a different direction and a different approach to this conflict which which could endanger not only the Ukraine, but, but also Europe as well. Now, what's also very troubling, uh, and, and particularly for those who are sympathetic uh, to uh, Putin, is the fact that we now see that the Kremlin is threatening Armageddon against the West if it, if it uh, loses in the Ukraine. So under this title, only a couple of days ago, published on the 18th of February in the Daily Mail, Kremlin threatens to unleash Armageddon on the West if it loses in Ukraine. Moscow warns it will fire nuclear missiles on London, Washington, Berlin, Kiev, if Russia is forced to give up any territory. Yeah, uh, it's interesting, Simon, because we were in this situation where one would think that and Putin might say, well, after I uh, tackle Ukraine, after we take over Ukraine, I'm going to come after the next countries, I'm going to go after the West then because of what they've been doing and their backing. And that victory would show a weakness uh, over the West. But actually, this seems to be manipulating a little bit, saying, look, if, if Ukraine wins, if we lose in this scenario, okay, we actually don't think the West is all that strong. Ukraine has resisted, but we're going to come after you. So stop arming Ukraine. 
stop supporting Ukraine and stop enabling Ukraine to resist in this particular way, or we're going to turn off. Absolutely. I, I think what we're seeing here from, from Putin is a kind of posturing. I mean, to yeah. make such a statement to actually threaten London, Berlin, and Washington with uh, nuclear weapons. It means that they are fear that they are losing, but they don't want to lose this, this war uh, with uh, humiliation. So in other words, I think what this is indicating is that they want to cut a deal with the West and they could possibly cut that kind of deal if we see that um, Donald Trump becomes, emerges as America's next president um, in return for cessation of violence uh, and hostilities in this war in Ukraine. We see that Russia would probably then keep the Crimea and the Donbass mm. as a means of saying, let's end this conflict because then he can go back and say, look, I secured these territories. Uh, we haven't been humiliated like we were with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union back in 1991. Uh, and this is what I think Russia and Putin are concerned about is that loss of honor. They don't want to face a humiliation. They want to go back and say, look, we've had a political and a military victory here and all this huge amounts of loss of life, weapons, finance has actually been worth it. So he can go back and say, look to the Russian people that we can be proud. This is what we've done. This is what we achieved. And by doing that, he wants to be able to threaten the West with, uh, with nuclear weapons in order to achieve his political and strategic objectives. Well, with the elections this year anticipated in Russia, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. These elections are almost always rigged in some form or another. And we can even think of the fact, you know, Dmitry Medvedev was the president um, uh, from 2008 to 2012. but then it's back to Putin. And basi basically, it's always been Putin this whole time. Everything. There's no democracy. Uh, and, and, and so what we've seen is um, this power that he has over the populace, over the various structures that are there, it's almost certain, barring uh, some divine intervention, which we pray for and which we um, ask that the Lord would in intervene in this situation, that he is going to remain president. This means that they will continue to see countless Russian men, some of them, as we've already commented, convicts or ex-cons being drafted in for certain perks and reprievals of... Just to be cannon fodder, though. Exactly. They're, they're, it's a meat grinder. And, yeah. and, and Putin has so many more that he is able to do uh, that too than Ukraine. Yeah, but also what we've seen in this one as well is that, that um, the whole perception of Russian power, Russian military power has been absolutely shattered as we've seen that uh, kind of Russia's mm. military technology is almost 30, 40 years behind an embarrassment. That of, the, uh, of the West. The fact that we've been able to supply um, the, the Ukrainians with Challenger tanks, our, the, our technology we're using, it is no match for the Russian forces at all. And this is why, for example, the former uh, president of Russia, um, Dmitry Meledev, is extremely concerned. And um, this is what he said, according to the Daily Mail, who's a close ally of Putin. He says this, he says, if um, a military defeat led to a return to the 1991 frontiers, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Moscow would unleash Armageddon. Attempts to return Russia to the borders of 1991 will lead to only one thing, he said, total towards a global war with Western countries using entire strategic arsenal of our state in Kyiv, uh, Berlin, London and Washington. He goes on to say that hypersonic nuclear missiles would also strike all other beautiful historical places that have been uh, included in the flight targets of our nuclear triad. He added, we have the courage to do this if the disappearance of a thousand year old country, our great motherland is at stake and the sacrifices made by the people of Russia over the centuries will be in vain. The answer is obvious, he goes on to say. Oh, so, so he's essentially threatening saying your history, your memories, your monuments, your temples, your churches, your buildings of notoriety, these places that you esteem and that you value in your motherlands, we have in our targets and we are very happy to destroy. The palaces of Westminster, 
um, Stephen's Tower in Big Ben, St. Paul's Cathedral, all of these places, they're in our targets, no issue. The Empire State Building, all of the, this is what he's saying. This is a clear-cut threat to the West that uh, if they continue to intervene, Russia is very happy to fire these hypersonic nuclear missiles. Simon, you and I talked about the hypersonic nuclear missiles at least a year before any invasion of, um, of Ukraine by Russia and the great damage that these could inf inflict. It's a, a new pioneering um, w weaponry form, essentially, and that would very quickly be able to see missiles reach uh, even the USA from Russia. Uh, Meledev also uh, suggested that Kyiv and the West should allow Putin uh, to have bits of Ukraine he thinks of as Russia. He says it's better to return everything to us before it's too late or we will return it to ourselves with maximum losses for the enemy like uh, Advduka, our warriors, our heroes. Uh, Medvedev, a deputy head of the Russian Security Council, which controls the war, hit out uh, what he called the Anglo-American uh, fosterlings who oppose Putin. He says the British and the German defence ministers, Grant Shapps and Boris Pistorius, were beep, beep, beep. Um, and uh, who believed the world cannot afford a Russian victory in the war, he said on his Telegram channel. If they got their way, there would be a direct and irreversible collapse of present-day Russia, including its newly invaded territories. Um, and so therefore, you know, effectively we're seeing here is that Russia feels like they're losing this war. They are fearful of losing the territories that they gained since 2014. Also, we have to put in context that despite the, the fact that we've seen the Russian invasion of the Ukraine two years ago, this war is essentially a decade old going back to 2014. Um, and uh, what the Russians and Putin wants more than anything is to keep the Donbass region of uh, the uh, east of the Ukraine together with Crimea and access to the Black Sea. On Friday the 16th of February, with a month to go until the Russian presidential election where Putin now stands, Unopposed, it's now widely believed that Alexei Navalny, who was in prison in Siberia, was murdered by Novichok, according to his widow Yolia Navalny, and uh, Russian authorities have refused to give the family his dead body. And this is one of those plights that we've seen time and again. It's repeated history throughout uh, the past couple of years, and indeed the years previous, standard from Putin. I think we also have to, uh, you know, actually give Yaveni the incredible accolades that he deserves. I mean, this is a man um, that effectively stood against uh, Putin in his totalitarian regime for now over a decade, um, exposing corruption within his regime, asking questions on uh, kind of Russian democracy, and has been a powerful force for democracy and liberty in Russia. And of course, you know, it's very cynical, but um, I don't think that this is a surprise that on the eve of the second anniversary of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, we find out that Yevgeny has uh, most probably been murdered with Nokochov um, and uh, killed because he is the only political force against uh, Putin, but also we have next month the Russian presidential elections. So of course he doesn't want people voting for Yevgeny in his absence, so in a way he's sending out two messages. Anyone who opposes me, anyone who opposes this war that we're conducting in the Ukraine, is going to meet the same death as Yevgeny. Um, and that is the message that clearly Putin wants to stand out. But the more he tightens his grip on the Russian population, the more this increases his illegitimacy in the eyes of so many Russian people that could lead to his downfall. And yet he has continued to try and justify his unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. He has uh, spoken of Nazis. He, particularly in relation to Mariupol, was targeting um, a particular minority of the Ukrainian armed services uh, acting as if this was indicative or representative of the entirety. It was a grouping that was made up of uh, some very far-right individuals, we'll say. Uh, at the same time, he said this was 
his, his whole goal. Okay, that particular grouping, that battalion, very minimal 1%, if that, of the Ukrainian military at the time, completely eradicated and wiped out. Um, not just by Putin, but Zelensky and others within, uh, following their own investigations and concerns internally, uh, disbanded that grouping. So uh, while there has been a history of corruption and there has been a history of uh, problems definitely within the Ukraine government, it's what led to Zelensky actually coming in, in to power in the first place, what we've seen is uh, definite purpose, definite sense of justice, uh, resolve, resilience against uh, an aggressor that was unprovoked. However, uh, Putin will always find a reason to continue and to justify his unprovoked invasion. He's even quoted Bible verses. Here's a report from our friends at CBN News. Death and destruction follow Russian forces as they continue attacking civilians. First responders cover the bodies of a family of five with blankets after a Russian missile strike in Chernihiv and an urgent rescue effort underway in Mariupol, where survivors could be trapped alive under the rubble of a shelter destroyed in a Russian airstrike. Out of the more than 1,000 believed to be in the building, only about 130 have been rescued so far. The White House is now tallying up Vladimir Putin's war crimes. President Biden said that, in his opinion, war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Personally, I agree. Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. With Russian forces stalled, the Ukrainians are mounting counterattacks. A battle outside Kyiv Wednesday shows Russian tanks being destroyed, possibly by a drone strike. CBN's George Thomas takes us inside a Ukrainian military checkpoint in the city. I've been to many uh, checkpoints, and there are thousands of these checkpoints uh, around the country, but this is exclusive because they never allow you to film inside these checkpoints because of security conditions. So this is basically a trench, right? So these are where the soldiers would uh, position themselves in case of a potential Russian attack. You've got the solid beams here. They've dug uh, probably about two, three feet uh, in here. But then I'm going to take you out uh, off the, uh, the trench here. And you can see here it's camouflaged obviously with camouflage uh, uh, material. Uh, and then this is kind of like a life here. You've got somebody on this side who is cutting wood because it's so cold during the evening times. They cut the wood on this side and then all the soldiers would be sleeping in these quarters. And uh, then they come and um, uh, cook, they cook their food. You've got uh, somebody making probably some borscht. This is uh, food that's also happening as well. So, uh, you know, this is the life on the security checkpoint. There are multiple soldiers who take their shifts, uh, you know, six, seven, eight hour shifts. And then they come here, take rest, get some food, and then they change their shifts again and go out uh, to the uh, checkpoint uh, to protect this particular part of the city. With invasion stalled, there are fears a frustrated Vladimir Putin might invent a pretext to use chemical weapons. We believe that Moscow may be setting the stage to use a chemical weapon and then falsely blame Ukraine to justify escalating its attacks on the Ukrainian people. Putin is said to be isolated and frustrated with the pace of the invasion, compounded by the impact of economic sanctions and internal protests. In a recent meeting, he lashed out at what he called pro-Western traitors, labeling them scum who should be cleansed from Russian society. Uh, another great uh, news report put together by our friends at CBN there. And there is a lot of support, particularly amongst uh, evangelical Christians for Putin, because they see uh, Putin standing up against the globalists, not going in this uh, progressive liberal agenda that seems to be uh, infecting uh, Europe and the United States and the Western world. He's made a stand against that. But he also is using the Russian Orthodox as a means to justify his invasion of the Ukraine, saying it's important to have be united with the spiritual uh, center of Russia, which is Kyiv in the Ukraine, and to bring the two brothers together again as one force. So how do you bring your brother together if you are brutally murdering, killing and raping uh, your brother and your sisters, as uh, Putin is saying. So it just shows the complete contradiction within his ideology. But, but Reagan, tell us uh, um, a little bit more about um, 
about Alexei uh, Navalny, um, mm. who yeah, is in a, a pretty, he died in pretty much what can only be described as a modern gulag, uh, where he suffered torture, imprisonment, mm all because he stood and defied um, President uh, Putin with incredible courage and bravery. Well, what many may not realize is that um, you know, Vinny was actually a very staunch atheist. And in his advocacy for justice, at some point or another, he began to see that uh, this atheism, somehow we don't know the full story, was incompatible with his desire for honesty, righteousness, and truth. In April 2021, a smuggled note said um, to Yevgeny Albats, uh, everything will be all right, and even if it isn't, we'll have the consolation of having lived honest lives. In uh, one of his statements uh, toward the uh, 2021 trial, his closing statement, as a matter of fact, to his 2021 uh, trial, he explained his own uh, beliefs uh, that his own faith in Christ was at the center of his political commitments. These were reported at the time in uh, the Moscow Times as well and definitely have irritated many of his secular admirers, but also uh, they go very much against some of the bizarre and weird support that Putin enjoys um, by so many evangelical Christians, despite evangelical Christians being primary individuals in his targets. Uh, this is what Novani said, Now I am a believer, and that helps me in a lot of my activities. Uh, because everything becomes much, much easier. I think about things less. Uh, there are fewer dilemmas in my life because there is a book in which, in general, it is more or less clearly written what action to take in every situation. It's not always easy to follow this book, of course, but I am actually trying. And so, as I said, it's easier for me, probably, than for many others to engage in politics. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. I've always thought that this particular commandment is more or less an instruction to activity. And so while certainly not really enjoying the place where I am, the prison, I, I have no regrets about coming back or about what I'm doing. It's fine because I did the right thing. On the contrary, I feel a real kind of satisfaction because at some difficult moment I did as required by the instructions and did not betray uh, the commandment. And, and there are so many others who have similarly testified to um, Christ and his work in inspiring them and leading them. N Navalny told the judge at that time, if you want, I'll talk to you about God and salvation. I'll turn up the volume of heartbreak to the maximum, so to speak. The fact is that I am a Christian, which usually rather sets me up as an example for constant ridicule in the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which he was leading, uh, because mostly our people are atheists, and I was once quite a militant atheist myself. What a, what a statement and uh, what a testimony. Uh, and now he's got the martyr's crown. So let's have a look at this uh, CBN news report that's only a day old, uh, uh, looking at the attempted or what now is believed to be an assassination on his life. Three days after reports of Alexei Navalny's death in a Russian Arctic penal colony where he was serving a 30-year prison sentence, his family still has not been allowed to view his body. A London newspaper quoted his sources describing Navalny's body as bruised. The body was taken by uh, investigative committee and they are conducting some sort of investigations uh, with him. Russian authorities say Navalny died from sudden death syndrome but most believe he was murdered. In a video, Navalny's widow said, we know exactly why Putin killed Alexei, and we will tell you soon. Navalny was the leading voice for democracy in Russia, despite being poisoned in 2020 and nearly dying. He returned to Russia against the advice of many and was arrested, and then jailed in its harsh penal system. The death of Alexei Navalny yesterday was a reminder of the extraordinary brutality of Putin and his government. Navalny seemed in perfect health just days before his death, seen on a monitor laughing and cracking jokes about his trial. The news provoked outrage around the world. An independent Russian human rights group says hundreds of people have been arrested for protesting Navalny's death. 
Republican Senator Lindsey Graham told CBS Face the Nation the U.S. needs to hit Putin hard by designating Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. A state sponsor of terrorism designation is a game changer. It would allow more sanctions. It would allow the Navalny family to go to U.S. court and sue Putin's Russia for killing of their loved one. Republican Congressman Mike Turner said he prayed with Navalny's widow in Germany and that the U.S. should respond with more military support for Ukraine. The Senate has passed a foreign aid bill, but the House has rolled out its own version. As a result of Navalny's death, that, uh, that we should even be that more strong in uh, funding Ukraine and passing this in the House and the Senate. Most of Russia's opposition is either dead, in exile, or in prison. With Navalny's death, many are wondering if this is the end of political dissent in Russia. Alexei Navalny was once asked what he'd tell Russians if he were killed for challenging President Vladimir Putin. He answered, you're not allowed to give up. If they decide to kill me, it means we are incredibly strong. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Somewhat counterintuitively, but at the same time, very predictably, simply because the, uh, the majority of Democrats in the U.S. system are recognizing a spade for a spade in the situation and uh, Vladimir Putin for uh, the evil um, despot that he is. Um, the Republican Party is increasingly filled with individuals who are uh, not actually recognizing injustice for what it is. And while there's as we've seen, condemnation of this assassination, it's not believed that it's actually going to hasten any ongoing or further aid for Ukraine to go ahead and, and try to finish this conflict. And this is because uh, uh, the Republicans are thinking, well, if uh, Biden is supporting the Ukrainians, then this must, be, uh, this must be wrong because he's wrong on so many other things. But on this one thing issue uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, I think it's imperative that uh, we support the Ukraine in its war against uh, Putin because if we see that Ukraine goes, then this poses an existential threat to Europe and Europe's in danger. That means we're in danger and this could lead to World War Three if we're not wiped out by Russia's nukes and our nukes in return. So the, the world could be on the brink uh, of, uh, of Armageddon. That makes things so dangerous, but God is sovereign. We, we've not learned the lesson from history. Republican Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin says, I don't like this reality. Vladimir Putin is an evil war criminal, but Vladimir Putin will not lose this war. And basically, it's because he's not going to lose this war. Yes, he's a violent war criminal, but he won't lose the war. So let's stop funding Ukraine. Let's. The U.S. is fully able and has the military power to be able to end this war very swiftly if it was to act in a, a decisive way. But it's chosen not to do that. We've adopted a policy of appeasement very much, a policy really of fear, and have caved in to the threats really of, of Putin. And, and this is creating a significant problem. And think about it, I, mean, um, I don't like this reality. If we had said this of uh, any of the other individuals uh, in the, the past century, I don't like this reality, Hitler is an evil war criminal, but Hitler's going to win this war. Many had that view. Well, I mean, I mean let, let's also remind uh, ourselves that uh, Putin came to power in around 2000 because of a kind of pretext invasion of uh, Chechnya. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was then followed by an invasion of Georgia in 2008. And then in 2014, we also see him then invade the Donbass through proxy militia forces that are loyal to his regime to instigate a civil war. We also see that he propped up Assad's regime in Syria as well. And this is where so many, even now, Russian military troops and personnel are deployed in Syria. Um, and, uh, you know, he poses a threat to the world. He's threatened Israel as yeah. well. Um, Africa, and, uh, he, they're the actively regime. involved in conflict zones in Africa, creating all sorts of disturbance and disruption. Iran, they're close allies with Iran, close allies with China, making alliances increasingly with North Korea. So what are we looking at here? An, a, a, a nation state and a president that we really want to work with, who stands for our Christian values? Look at his allies. That should tell you enough. You can learn a lot about a, a man by the friends, friends he, he keeps. keeps. Absolutely, absolutely. Xi of China, um, Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran. Um, he's even showed support for, for Hamas 
um, and post October the 7th, and Hamas even said that this was a gift to Putin. So it just shows you the kind of magnitude that the West is facing. And I think it's also waking up to the fact that, yeah, Russia does pose an existential threat to the West. Uh, we don't know how long that this war will continue, but we also know that God is sovereign and that history is his story. And however much the Russian regime may want to press the nuclear button, it's all in God's hands. And that won't happen unless the Lord wills it to happen. So we can, we can take peace in that, but it's also a reminder of us to pray as well for uh, peace and security in the Ukraine, particularly the Christians who have faced unprecedented kind of persecution uh, and being killed at the hands of P Putin's evil regime as well. It's so important that we recognize the divine sovereignty infused in all of this. God is working in and through everything to accomplish His perfect plan and His purpose. We may not always be able to see the immediate reasons or the immediate points, but we know that God is in it all. He's bringing people to Himself, and He's bringing everything toward that completion of time. We do see in the scriptures prophetically that Russia will be part of an amalgamation uh, against Israel at the end of times. Uh, so Reagan, great doing a program with you today. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching at home. And I want to dedicate uh, this program today to my good friend in Ukraine, Pastor Dmitry um, and his family. And so let's continue to pray for Christians in Ukraine that they would have the strength to endure this ongoing war in Ukraine. So thank you for watching this week's edition of Behind the Headlines.